Lord, we, uh, with anticipation, we open your word today. We remember what we read in Isaiah, that to this one I will look, to the one who trembles at your word. And Lord, we would pray that we would have a heart that would tremble at your word. We wouldn't take it flippantly or lightly, but that we would treat it reverently and with all the respect it deserves. And that, Lord, it would do its work of changing us and transforming us and making us like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. So when we come to Acts chapter 14, we're in the middle of Paul and Barnabas's first missionary journey. They start out on that journey in chapter 13, and it takes two chapters for Luke to record everything that took place. At the end of chapter 14, they're completed with their first journey, and they come back to the sending church, which was the church in Antioch. Now, we've already seen what the Lord did through these apostles on the island of Crete, and then what he did through them on the, on, in the town of Pisidian Antioch. So those are studies that we've already done before. Today we're going to be taking a look at what the Lord do, did through them as they ministered in several towns. And he mentions them here, Iconium, Lyconia, Lystra, and Derbe, four different towns. Now, in verse 21, Debbie just read this verse, it says, after they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they focus on that verse, they made many disciples. How many disciples were there in these four towns before they set foot in them? None. Zero. <laughs> they were going to a region where there were no Christians. And when, by the time they left, there were many disciples. In fact, there were churches planted in um, not only Crete, which is the island they went to first, and not only Antioch, Pisidian, but also Iconium, Lyco I'm sorry, Iconium, Lyconia, Lystra, and Derby. So they were extremely effective when it came to making disciples. And that's what I want to hone in on today and help you to see, is these guys were disciple makers extraordinaire. They, they could go into a region where there was no Christians, and by the time they left a few months later, there was a church. And there's principles that I think the Lord wants us to see from this because the Lord wants us also to make disciples. Now, does anybody know why I would even make that statement? Why do you, th people say, well, the Great Commission, that was given to the 11 apostles, not to us. But the problem with that view is Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And here's the next part. And lo, I am with you always, even to your death. That's what it would have said if it was made to the 11 apostles. But he says, even to the end of the age. We're not to the end of the age yet. The 11 apostles have all died. But Jesus said he's giving this commission and he's going to be with the people doing the commission until the end of the age, until Jesus comes back. So what does that mean? It means all of us have a responsibility to be involved in disciple making until Jesus Christ returns. There's three aspects to disciple making according to Jesus. Going, baptizing, and teaching. Going, Going denotes intentionality. You make a plan and you do it. You follow through. Right? You, you, you're not going to go anywhere unless you know where you're going. So disciple making starts with simply an intention to do it. You say, okay, Lord, you've commanded me to do this. I'm going to. Secondly, baptizing. That tells you that you've led that person to Jesus because that's who gets baptized people who have faith in Christ. So you've gone, and then you've explained to them about Jesus, and they have believed. If they come to faith, then you baptize them. And again, this baptism isn't just for pastors. You get the privilege of baptizing if you lead someone to Christ. Thirdly, it's teaching. Your disciple-making is not over once you have baptized them. You continue to teach them to observe everything that Jesus commanded, meaning that you try to help this new believer grow so that they begin to, to look like Christ in their life. They begin to do the things that Jesus commanded in their daily living. So there's the three aspects, going, baptizing, and teaching. And all of us, from the highest to the lowest Christian, are, are responsible to do something in making disciples. 
So we had to think just off the top of the, our heads this morning, ask yourself the question, am I doing anything regarding making disciples? Am I going? Am I baptizing? Am I teaching? So all of us should be doing something in that regards. And maybe if you're not, maybe today the Lord's going to help you take the first step. He'll direct you to what you should start with. That's my goal. That's my hope for you. Okay, so we are called to make disciples. These guys were great disciple makers, so let's learn from them. That's the idea this morning. Let's see what they did and see if we can learn from them. You know, I've, I've known some Christians that have said, I, I can't be involved in disciple making because I just don't know enough. I just, I feel like I'm too young in the Lord. I just don't know everything I ought to know. But these people have been walking with Jesus 20 or 30 years. So they're, they're never going to get to the place where they feel like they know enough to make disciples. They're going to die without ever having stepped out and done anything to make a disciple. And that's not what we want. We want to all be involved in some way or another in this work. Okay, so let's go to Acts chapter 14 and let's see some of the marks that made Paul and Barnabas so effective at making disciples. And I'm just going to list them for you before we get into them. The four marks I see here are their passion, their humility, their persistence, and their love. Passion, humility, persistence, and love. So let's take a look at their passion first of all. Let's go to Acts 14, verse 1. In Iconium, they entered the synagogue of the Jews. Remember, that's their common practice. In whatever city they go to, they always start in the synagogue. That's where they have uh, a religious audience. And they are, they've been given the opportunity to stand up and address the synagogue attenders. And so that's how they always do it. And it says, they spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and of Greeks. They spoke in such a manner that a large number believed. Now, this is a really interesting verse because it links the way we speak to the effects that it produced. Sometimes, especially those of us who are reformed in our theology, we believe in the absolute sovereignty of God, we can be so taken up with that idea that we, we think that the way we do what we do for the Lord doesn't matter at all. But accordingly, or... That's not the word I wanted. Uh, it does. It does matter. Because here, they spoke in such a manner that many believed. It is true that God has ordained the ends. It's true that God has already chosen before the foundation of the world who he was going to save. Who he's going to save. But it is also true that he's ordained the means to arrive at those ends. And the means he has chosen to use is passionate witnessing or passionate preaching. People who speak in such a manner that others believe. See, they weren't indifferent when they spoke. They weren't apathetic. They, they, they didn't speak about things that they had no interest in or had not powerfully impacted them and their own personal lives. They spoke in a passionate, fervent, earnest way to the people they were addressing. You guys see that? Okay, so let's, let's drill down into that whole idea. If we want our witnessing to transform others' lives, then we must already be transformed by that same gospel. It must have been doing some kind of a work in us so that when we speak to others, it's the overflow of what God has already done inside. And I want to read to you a little bit this morning. I hope this is interesting and edifying to you, but this comes from a book that J.C. Ryle wrote about an evangelist who lived in the 1700s. His name was George Whitfield. And I want to read to you about that because I think it illustrates this point. So J.C. Ryle says, A leading characteristic of Whitfield's preaching was his tremendous earnestness. One poor uneducated man said of him that he preached like a lion. He succeeded in showing people that he at least believed all he was saying and that his heart and soul and mind and strength were bent on making them believe it too. His sermons were not like the morning and evening gun at Portsmouth, a kind of formal discharge fired off as a matter of course that disturbs nobody. They were all life and fire. 
There was no getting away from them. Sleep was next to impossible. You must listen whether you liked it or not. There was a holy violence about him which firmly took your attention by storm. You were fairly carried off your legs by his energy before you had time to consider what you would do. This, we may be sure, was one secret of his success. We must convince men that we are in earnest ourselves if we want to be believed. The difference between one preacher and another is often not, not so much in the things said as in the manner in which they are said. And don't don't relegate this to just pastors now. This has relevance to your life as a Christian because God has called you to witness for him. And so witness passionately. So take the principles you're learning here from Whitfield and just internalize them to your own life. And let me tell you this little story here because I think it, it's, it's very helpful. Ryle goes on and he writes, It is recorded by one of his biographers that an American gentleman once went to hear him for the first time. In consequence of the report he heard of his preaching powers, the day was rainy, the congregation comparatively thin, and the beginning of the sermon rather heavy. Our American friend began to say to himself, this man is no great wonder after all. He looked around and he saw the congregation as little interested as himself. One old man in front of the pulpit had fallen asleep. But all at once Whitfield stopped short. His countenance changed, and then he suddenly broke forth in an altered tone. If I had come to speak to you in my own name, you might well rest your elbows on your knees and your heads on your hands and sleep. And once in a while look up and say, what is this babbler talking of? But I have not come to you in my own name. No, <laughs> I have come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Here he brought down his hand and foot with a force that made the building ring. And I must and will be heard. The congregation startled. The old man woke up at once. I, I, cried Whitfield, fixing, fixing his eyes on him. I have waked you up, have I? I meant to do it. I am not come here to preach to stocks and stones. I have come to you in the name of the Lord God of hosts. And I must and will have an audience. The hearers were stripped of their apathy at once. Every word of the sermon after this was heard with deep attention, and the American gentleman never forgot it. What an interesting little... It, it illustrates this idea that they spoke in such a manner that many believed. So when you speak to people about Christ, do they know you believe what you're saying? Because it comes with such earnestness from your heart, such sincerity, such sober uh, feeling... Because the Lord has, has done a work in you, you can't help but express that to them. That's the idea I want to get across to you today. So let's, in our witnessing, let's be earnest, passionate, and sincere. Secondly, persistence. Let's notice their persistence in disciple making. Verse 2. But the Jews who had disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. Therefore, they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord who is testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. Now just notice what Luke has told us here. He said, the Jews stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them, poisoned them against the brethren. Now the brethren would be the disciples that have already been made here in Iconium. That some people believed his preaching, and so you've got believers, you've got disciples, you've got brethren. But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of these Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. So there's this persecution that is starting to take place. The Jews, unbelieving Jews, are stirring up the Gentiles to poison the minds of these new believers. But what I want you to notice is the first verse of verse 3. Therefore, they spent a long time there, speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord. Now, wait a minute. That doesn't even make sense. Persecution's taking place, and it says, therefore, they stayed, and they continued to speak. Now, why would Luke tell us that because there was this poisoning of their minds by the unbelieving Jews and the Gentiles, that they stayed there longer and continued to speak to them? And I think the answer is because there was all of these new believers that 
Paul and Barnabas were concerned about. They were concerned that they had come to faith in Christ, but there was the danger that their minds are going to be poisoned by these unbelieving Jews and these Gentiles. And they, they're so concerned about these new believers that instead of hightailing it out of there, which most people would probably do at this point, they determined, well, we're staying. We're not going anywhere because these believers need our help. So they continued speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord. They needed to ground these new converts in the truth so that they couldn't be moved by these ungodly, poisoned minds of the unbelievers. So that's what we find in verse 2 and 3. Now in verses 4 and 7, the opposition gets so intense that there's an actual attempt to stone them. And at that point, they decide, we have to leave or we're going to die. And we feel it's better for us to move on and preach somewhere else than to stay here and die. So they did. They fled to another town. And you might think at this point, why don't they just decide to hang it up, go back to Antioch where it's safe, and let things calm down? But they don't do that. The, the persistence of these apostles is amazing to me. In fact, they're, they're unstoppable. You persecute them in one place, they go to another place. You put a threat on their life to stone them, they flee to another town, but they don't stop. They just continue preaching in that town. Now notice later on in our story in verse 19, they, first of all, they preached in Iconium. There was persecution, but they stayed. When there's a threat on their life, they left. Then they finally arrive um, in Lystra, and Jews from Iconium and from Antioch, and Antioch's 100 miles away. So these unbelieving Jews are really determined to, to squash their work. They don't want it to go anywhere. They're traveling 100 miles, and, and this is in a day where you can only go 20 or 25 miles a day by walking or by riding some kind of a camel or donkey or whatever. It takes you a long time. It takes you probably close to a week to go 100 miles. But they're actually absolutely determined to squash the work of Paul and Barnabas. And so you have these people coming from Antioch and Iconium, and they don't do the dirty work themselves. It says they won over the crowds, so now the crowds are going to do their dirty work for them, which we find everywhere they go. They just stir up crowds. They get a riot started. That's how they, how they persecuted them. And in this place, they weren't so fortunate as to avoid the stoning. They were able to avoid the stoning in Iconium, but here at Lystra, Paul was actually stoned. And he was probably stoned rather than Barnabas, because Paul was the chief speaker, he was the lead teacher or preacher, and he was the one who was taking the leadership role in this missionary journey. So they targeted him, and they decided that they're going to stone him and make a lesson out of him. Now, remember what stoning was like. It was a, a gruesome, horrible way to die. I mean, try to imagine dying by someone throwing big boulders at your head until it crushed your head. Uh, I, mean, I mean, it's just gruesome to consider that, but that's the way they were trying to kill Paul. And in fact, they thought they had killed him because they dragged his body probably onto some garbage heap because they thought he was dead and just, okay, we'll just leave him here. But the disciples stood around him and they started to notice his, his eyeball or his, his eyelash starting to twitch a little bit. Wait a minute, maybe he's not dead. Maybe he moved his finger a little bit. And so the disciples, I'm imagining, would gather around him and start praying for him. Lord, heal him, raise him up, Lord. He's not dead yet. And that's exactly what happened. Paul got up. <laughs> he got up and notice the verse while the disciples stood around him he got up and entered the city wait a minute that's where they stoned him he got back up and went back to the place where they tried to kill him I mean <laughs> these guys are absolutely unstoppable unless you kill him he, he's going to continue to do what God called him to do and then the next day, it says, he went away with Barnabas to Derby. Derby was 58 miles from Lystra. So the next day, Paul, he'd almost been killed the day before. 
The very next day, he walks or rides on a camel or whatever, 58 more miles to go to Derby so that he can t continue to preach the gospel. There's a preacher by the name of Dr. Jowett. He made this statement, I once saw the track of a bleeding hair across the snow. That was Paul's track across Europe. In other words, if you've seen a rabbit walking in the snow with his, the red spots behind it, you know that it's, it's injured. He said that was what Paul was like as he's traveling across Europe preaching the gospel. In Galatians chapter 6, he says, I bear in my body the brand marks of Jesus Christ. I wonder if he was referring to this stoning when he almost was killed. So he gets back up. He goes into the city. 58 miles later, he's preaching again to the town of Derby. So we see Paul and Barnabas' dogged determination and persistence in spite of the intense trials. Now, we, we are more prone to give up at the slightest opposition. If we try to witness to somebody and we're rejected, we say, well, that, that does it. I'm done. I'm not taking this rejection anymore. The, the, these guys had intense rejection. They, there are threats on their life and then actual attempts to kill them, and they kept going, and they wouldn't be stopped. And so the lesson for us here is let's not be slow or quick. Let's not be quick to give up when the Lord has given us a task. When he's called us to make disciples and things aren't going so well, and we don't feel like continuing because we don't like the rejection, or maybe we're not seeing the, the success that we want to see in our work, let's not give up. We ought to follow in the, in, the, in, the, in the trail here, the path of these apostles that were so doggedly determined that they were refused to give up. So we see their passion, and we see their persistence, and thirdly, we see their humility. And we see that from the story, um, starting in verse 8, when Paul arrives in Lystra, he's preaching there, there's a crowd of people, and among the crowd, there's this man who is lame. The Bible says, he had no strength in his feet, and he had never walked before. Okay, so this is not a person who was born normally and had walked, and then at some point had an accident. This is a person who had never walked in their entire life. They had no strength in their feet. So, the muscles have atrophied. There's nothing there. Even if you put him up and tried to stand him up, he'd fall right over because there's no strength in his feet at all, which makes the miracle here that much more incredible. So, Paul sees him, and it says here, this man was listening to Paul, verse 9, as he spoke, who when he, when Paul had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well. Now that's an interesting statement. How do you see that someone has faith to be made well? Because faith is invisible. How do you see faith? Well, you see it when God gives you a special gift. And that's what's happening, I believe, because it says he stared at him. He fixed his gaze on him. Paul could see into the invisible spiritual realm. God was giving him the ability to see something that he was about to do. God was going to heal him, and God was communicating through, I believe, a word of knowledge. This man has faith to be made well. How else do you explain Paul saying, stand upright on your feet? If the guy had never, say he's 40 years old, he never walked in his life, that takes a lot of faith, doesn't it? To say, stand upright on your feet? Well, he can't. He can't stand upright on his feet. But God had somehow told Paul, communicated through a special spiritual gift that he was about to heal this man and the man had faith. And so that gave Paul the boldness to, to speak out what he did. So I see here the gift of a word of knowledge, the gift of faith, and also probably the gift of miracles. Not just healing, probably miracles, because the guy had no strength in his legs at all. So it's not just that he needed to be healed, he needed a miracle. He needed to be restored to what he should have been if, when, he was, when he was born the first time. So that's what takes place. This tremendous miracle takes place. So how did the pagan crowds respond to the miracle once they saw this man walking in their midst? 
Well, they thought that Paul and Barnabas were gods. So this is a superstitious crowd. The interesting thing is that one of their poets 50 years earlier, earlier had written um, a little story, a vignette, and the people had kind of looked at that as a legend. It was a superstitious legend that a lot of the common people actually believed. And the, the poet's name was Ovid, and he wrote an ancient legend. He said that the supreme god Zeus and his son Hermes once visited the hill country of Phrygia, which was not far from where they were. They were disguised as mortal men. So, you've got Zeus and Hermes come down, these gods come down to the earth disguising themselves as men. They sought hospitality. They kept asking if anybody had a place where they could stay. But they were rebuffed a thousand times. Nobody would let them in. Nobody would give them a place to stay. At last, this elderly peasant couple, Philemon and Bacchus, offered them lodging in their tiny home. And then later, the gods destroyed all of the other people because they wouldn't give them any hospitality. But they rewarded this, this peasant couple. Philemon and Bacchus. And so the people here evidently were anxious that they not suffer, they didn't want to be wiped out again, like happened before through the gods Zeus and Hermes when they disguised themselves as men. They didn't want that to happen again. And so <laughs> they said, hey, Paul, you've got to be Hermes. Or I got it backwards, didn't I? Zeus. Barnabas, you've got to be Hermes. They said Paul was Zeus because he was the chief speaker. He was the supreme god. Hermes, Barnabas was his right-hand man. He was going to be the lesser god. But they believe that's, that's what they've got to be because mortal men can't do a miracle like what we just saw in this man. That wasn't all. Not only did they think they were gods, but the priest of Zeus goes and gets an ox to sacrifice to them, and some garland. And at first, Paul and Barnabas don't know what's going on. They don't understand what's happening because they're speaking in the Lyconian language, not their language. So, so they're, they're babbling back and forth really fast, but they don't know what they're saying. But then they see this priest lugging an ox down the road, and he's got some garland. He's putting the garland around Paul's neck, and he's taking the ox about ready to slit its throat, and then it clicks. They're trying to sacrifice to us. And what do they do at that point? What do Paul and Barnabas do? Let, let's find it. Let me find the verse here. 14, 14. 14. Okay. When the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes. Why would they do that? Grief. Yeah. They're an expression of grief and horror that anybody would worship them as a god. And they rushed out into the crowd, and they, they give this little, little talk, this little mini sermon. Don't worship us. We're just men like you. Worship the God of heaven who made all things. Now, remember in the book of Acts, in chapter 12, we had another guy who was worshipped as God. Do you remember Herod? He stood up, and he addressed the crowd, and the people said, These are the words of a God, not of a man. And do you remember what happened to Herod? An angel of the Lord struck him, and he was eaten by worms and died. So, a very big contrast. You have Herod, he accepted the worship. He accepted the glory, and God struck him. God killed him. And here you have Paul and Barnabas, who absolutely refused to have anything to do with people worshiping them, and God continues to use them in their ministry. Now, I believe this is a very dangerous situation perhaps the most dangerous of all, even more than the persecution they faced. Because, I mean, let, let's just accept the fact, it can be very tempting for a mere mortal to accept worship from other mortals. That's what cult leaders do. They turn into a god, and they accept and glory in the worship of their followers. Paul and Barnabas could have said something like, wow, this is kind of cool. Hey, if we play our cards right, we'll get our own temple, we'll get our own palace, we'll get our own harem. 
why don't we just go along with it? Maybe we can even witness for Jesus Christ better if they have such a high respect for us and think we're gods. You know, who knows what would be going on in the minds of a person. But, but the desire to be worshipped is not foreign to human beings. We would like to take the place of God. We would like to be in the place where people actually worship. And we need to make sure that we take the humble posture, like Paul and Barnabas did, and absolutely refuse to have anything to do. If you want the worship of other people, what you're doing is you're taking the glory that is only God's, and you're taking it to yourself. And the Bible says in Isaiah, God says, I am God, and there is no other, and I will not give my glory to another. So if you start taking the glory that should go to God alone, God is going to deal with you severely, just like he did with Herod. At the very least, he's going to put you on the shelf, and he's not going to refuse to use you in his work anymore. You might have a big name among men, but you have, you have nothing when it comes to your relationship with God. He's going to set you aside, and you're going to find out that you're, he's going to deal with you, either in this life or in the life to come. The Lord is going to deal with you, because he won't allow his children to take that which belongs to him alone. So here's the principle. In our disciple making, we have to determine that we will walk before the Lord humbly. When the Lord starts to use you, let's say he really starts to use you and you, you find yourself being able to make disciples. You find that you've been able to lead someone to Christ and baptize them, and then you continue to teach them, and you start to think, wow, I'm, I'm something special. Look at what I'm doing here. Look at the people that have come to Christ. Wow. Watch out. Watch out. Because you need to always remember that any success that you have had is due to Him alone. Not you. Just remember how you used to be before you had any success. That's who you are in and of yourself. It's when God's Spirit comes upon you that you have the ability to do anything in the kingdom of God. The glory is His. The credit is His. Refuse to take that glory unto yourself. So that's a good lesson that we see from these apostles. They were humble men. So God is not interested in using superstar Christians who will bask in the glory that goes to God alone. Remember in the Old Testament, the kind of people that God chose to use? Moses. How did Moses feel when God chose him to go to the Pharaoh? He said, Lord, use somebody else, not me. I'm not eloquent. I can't speak good. Not me. Anybody else but me. <laughs> That's how we felt. Or what about Gideon? God comes to Gideon as he's threshing out the wheat where he can't be seen by the enemies. And Gideon was of the tribe of Manasseh, but the, the lowliest family within the tribe of Manasseh. And Gideon was the youngest one in the family. He was like the least likely to succeed in life. Gideon. God chose that man to do his work. And then he takes 30,000 and gets rid of 29,700. So there's only 300 left. And he delivers Israel with 300 men to show that he's the one that did it, not Gideon right? Uh, and then there's David. God deliberately chose David. Now David was one of eight sons. All of them were older. All of them were stronger and buff, buffer and bigger and all of that. But God deliberately chose the youngest one to use. God delights in choosing people that we would never choose to do his work through them. Ordinary Christians that determined to give him the glory. So determine that you're going to be one of those kinds of Christians. And God can use you to do his work. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 31, it says, God chose the foolish, the weak, the base, and the despised. Do you know why? So that no one would boast before God. And that whoever boasts would boast in the Lord. That's why God did it that way. God hates boasting. We are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not as a result of works. Why? That any one of us should boast. God has devised a plan of salvation that no one can boast in. 
That's how much he hates it. He came up with a plan so that we, it would be impossible for any of us to boast. So let's take the humble position before God so that he can use us to do his work. Okay, and then the fourth principle here I see from these guys is that of love. This comes out in verses 21 to 23. And we could call this, if we wanted to give it another name, we could call it follow-up. They love these new Christians enough to follow up with them, not to leave them on their own or to abandon them, but to continue to minister into their life. After they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Notice that? They returned. They didn't just say, well, they raised their hands at an altar call. I guess they're once saved, always saved. They'll be fine. <laughs> no, they went back because they knew they needed, they needed help. They needed care. They needed love. And it says, verse 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Now there are four verbs that I want you to take note of. Strengthen, encourage, lead, and commend. Strengthen, encourage, lead, and commend. That's how they showed love for these new Christians. Verse 22 says, strengthening the souls of the disciples. The word strengthen means that they made them solid. They made their souls solid. They gave their souls a solid foundation. And the way they would have done that is by teaching them the word of God. These are new Christians. They, they don't understand what Paul and Barnabas understand. And so Paul and Barnabas are, are pouring into them, teaching them the word of God. Secondly, encourage. Encouraging them to continue in the faith. Now that word encourage is the same Greek word that we have translated as exhort. So this word means to urge them to a course of action. They laid a solid foundation by teaching them the word, and then they exhorted them and encouraged them to apply the word to their life. That's what we do when we make disciples. We teach the word, and then we exhort them and encourage them to put it into practice. So it's not just laying a foundation, but it's also exhorting. Third, lead. They led them. They did that by appointing elders in every church. New Christians need leaders. They need pastors, they need shepherds, don't they? That will watch over their souls, that will continue to teach them the word of God. And so, when we're making disciples, we should strengthen them by teaching, encourage them by exhorting, and then make sure they have leadership, spiritual leadership in their life. If this person you're discipling is not part of a church, then encourage them to become part of a local church where there's a godly pastor who will care for their soul and teach them the Word of God. It might be your church, it might be another church. Maybe you even go to that church for a week or two just to make sure that the teaching is solid and that you introduce them to the pastor and ask the pastor to take special interest in this new believer. We, we want to make sure there's godly spiritual leadership provided, elders for each believer. And then the last thing they did in their follow-up is they commended. They brought these new believers to the Lord in prayer, and they committed them to the Lord into His capable hands. They asked the Lord to watch over them, and to keep them, and to bring them safely to His heavenly kingdom. So they commended them. They entrusted them into the Lord's hands. So this is, this is our work. As you are working with another person, pouring yourself into them, that's what discipleship really is, is pouring yourself into them. Strengthen them, encourage them, make sure they have leadership in their life, godly leadership, and then commend them to the Lord. Pray for them. Commit them and entrust them to the Lord. Ask the Lord to be their shepherd. So, here we see four principles for disciple making. Passion, persistence, humility, and love. 
loving them enough not to abandon them, but to continue to minister to them until they're at a place where they can now go and make disciples of their own.